a reenactment group. We represent uh, the German Home Guard, which was originally created in October 1944, and thus were known and acted as the last defenders of the uh, German Reich, as the Allies from both East and West closed in. Now basically, rather like the British Home Guard formed in the summer of 1940, the motivation for forming the German Volkssturm was because as uh, obviously the war was going very badly for Germany by the end of uh, 1944, they know full well that Germany is standing on the eve of being invaded. Germany though in the meantime, during the preceding five and a half years of warfare, has suffered enormous casualties, both in terms of men as well as materiel. So the Germans, as I said, motivated by a very similar desire to the British back in 1940, decided to form a home guard. Now, they were called the Volkster. Uh, that label was given to them, meaning the People's Storm. And the idea was that there would be a mass mobilization of all of the manpower that hadn't yet been tapped. Now, that, of course, meant predominantly middle-aged and older men. Uh, and thus, that is why, as you can see, none of us are in the spring of youth. Uh, the average age of the Volkssturm was around about 55 years of age, though the Volkssturm did take people, as yeah, they took Hitler Youth, in aged 14 and 15, all the way through to many much older people. They were meant to only take men mm -hmm. up to the age of 60. However, we know from the records that there were men in their 70s and even a few in their 80s. So. Um, in that sense, and towards the end, from March 1945, they even took women. So we're very proud to say that Volkssturm was one of history's first ever equal opportunity employers. We would take you, whether you were young, old, male, female, and we even took disabled people. How about that? Um, so everyone was liable to call up to the Volkssturm. Now, basically, uh, some units were called up almost immediately. Others were only called out as, quote, the enemy approached the door, as it were. So some units uh, were established for a number of months. Other units literally only existed locally for a matter of days or sometimes even hours. Now, because Germany was quite literally at the end of its tether by the end of 1944, the Volkssturm tended to, uh, shall we say, get what was left. And that meant that uh, many of the men only initially received armbands. Why did they only get armbands? Sometimes all that there was was their civilian clothes to wear. Germany, though, had signed the Geneva Convention, and under the Geneva Convention, providing you wore an armband to designate you as a combatant, you were then to be treated as a soldier under the Geneva Convention. So the armband becomes very important. So many, two of my colleagues behind me, as you can see, are still in their civilian clothing, but they're both proudly wearing different types of armband. That would mean under the Geneva Convention, they were not to be treated as bandits or terrorists, but would be treated, uh, if captured, as combatant soldiers and hopefully treated according to the Geneva Convention. This worked fine in the West, facing the British, the Americans, Canadians, they too had signed the Geneva Convention and generally respected it. So, if you remember the Volkssturm, you surrendered to the British or the Americans or the Canadians, you're usually fine. However, the Soviet Union never signed the Geneva Convention. They did not recognise that particular rule. And unfortunately, on the Eastern Front, many of the captured Volkssturm, I'm afraid, particularly early on when they were caught in their civilian clothing, even though they were wearing an armband, they would just be taken to a nearby ditch and disposed of. However, other members of the Volkssturm were more fortunate. My colleague on the right here, as you can see, is wearing some military equipment. It is a bit of a mix and match. He's got a Fosham Jaeger a combat jacket. He's got standard German jack boots. So even the um, Volkssturm uh, men who did receive military equipment, it tended to be bits and pieces. So it tended to be uh, Luftwaffe out elements, army elements, even Kriegsmarine elements. Also in terms of weapons, 
by late 44, Germany is literally running out of weapons, being heavily bombarded from the air by the British and the Americans. This is severely impacting their military production. So the only way they can equip many of the Volksturm units is to issue them with foreign rifles. Germany had captured many Italian, French, Dutch, Russian rifles, and if there was ammunition for them, they issued them. And that's my colleague in the middle here, that's a French Bertier rifle that would have been captured obviously back in 1940. And although it took French ammunition, a 7.5 round, the Germans had captured a lot of 7.5 French ammunition. So he would be probably lucky to get 50 or 60 rounds. So there you go. However, some of them were issued with proper German rifles. My colleague here does have a proper German K98, taking German 7.92, so he's more fortunate. And on my right here, my colleague has been very, very fortunate. He's been issued with a Sturmgewehr 44, history's first ever assault rifle. So the armament of the Volkssturm in terms of small arms is very, very diverse. Some were lucky. You do hear stories of a few of them receiving, say, an Italian rifle, and you get your Italian rifle, five or 10 rounds of ammunition, a pat on the back and please go and stop that Russian tank if you would. That never ended well. However, to help them attack Soviet or even Allied tanks, my colleagues here had what are known as Panzerfausts, meaning quite literally tank fist. Now this was a revolutionary weapon. A lot of the Volkssturm relied on this, as did normal German soldiers. Um, on the left here, we have a late version of the, of the Panzerfaust known as a Panzerfaust 100. I'll explain what that means. On the right here, that's an early version. It's quite literally known as the Panzerfaust Klein, meaning little, and 30. Now, what did that mean? Basically, these are revolutionary weapons. At the start of World War II, the only way to knock out a tank was basically with a field gun or some form of other artillery weapon, fairly cumbersome. Very quickly, as the war progresses, the Germans, and to be fair, the British and the Americans as well, want to give each individual soldier the capacity to stop a tank. Uh, the Americans come up with the bazooka. Um, that's not too bad a weapon. It's still fairly cumbersome, needs a crew of two. The British have what's known as the Piat. Um, that's an anti-tank weapon. It's quite, quite literally a wind-up weapon using a great big spring. Everyone I've spoken to says it's rubbish, but that's another story. Uh, if you've ever seen the film, um, A Bridge Too Far, you'll see a Piat being used on the bridge. Um, once it works, once it doesn't work. The Germans, though, came up with the Panzerfaust. They start coming out in early 1944. And the idea is that warhead you see, basically it's a cheap weapon, costs in old money, those of you remember the old money, before decimalization, about seven and a half shillings to manufacture. Very, very cheap. For those of you who don't come to that, it's about 35 modern pence. So it's basically a hollow tube with a gunpowder charge in, and it would fire, it literally stays in, fall over. It throws the projectile out, and the warhead, when it hits the enemy tank, the explosive charge is a shape charge, and it produces a jet of superheated plasma, burns through the side of the enemy tank, and cooks everyone inside. Why is it revolutionary? Well, it's revolutionary for two reasons. One, one soldier. One person can operate it with minimal training. Probably they reckon 30, 40 minutes to explain its workings. Two, it's incredibly cheap. The Germans produce about six million of these and they are very, very effective. They can kill any tank of World War II. No tank is proof against them. And it revolutionizes warfare. So even these middle-aged men or young boys, if they're hit the youth, armed with these Panzerfaust could take on the most advanced tanks, whether they're Allied Shermans, uh, British Cromwell tanks, um, or, or, or Russian T-34s. The Russians capture a few and prove and use them against the Germans, and they even managed to knock out the King Tiger. So it shows you how effective the Panzerfaust was. Anyway, as I said before, the Volkssturm were a home guard. The idea was they were going to defend Germany from invasion. So unlike the British Home Guard, they do get to see combat. 
Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Dad's Army uh, on the television. Uh, the experience of the Volkssturm could not have been more different. Yes, they're the same older men. Uh, many of us you'll see wearing World War I decorations. That's because many of the Volkssturm were veterans from World War I, called up again from factories and offices where they'd been prior to that. They get to see combat. It's estimated that about 700,000, there's no precise figure, but about 700,000 men and a few women serve actually in combat in the Volkssturm. Of that 700,000, 150,000, according to Red Cross records, are combat fatalities. So it's a very different experience. About another 200, 250,000 are wounded. So very, very different from the Dad's Army you see. Although there are some other similarities, because the other problem with the image that we get of the British Dad's Army was of older men. The reality is that that Dad's Army only existed in Britain for about a year and a half. By 1941, much of the older men in Dad's are in the home, British Home Guard have been sent home. They're replaced by 16, 17 year olds. If you look at photos of the British Home Guard in 1942, 1943, they're all teenagers. They're being trained up prior to conscription. And in a funny sort of way, the Volkssturm was similar, because yes, they're made up of older men. They don't get to go home, sadly, for them. However, they're also taking the hit the youth in age 14, 15, and 16. Obviously, the difference is they get to see real combat. The Volkssturm, as I said before, if they're facing the Soviets in the east, they get to see a lot of very nasty combat, and therefore a lot of hard-fought battles. In the West, taken from the records, the Volkssturm tend to rather sensibly fire off their ammunition and surrender. Uh, quite often, particularly for the Canadians and the British, they tended, if they were 50s and 60s year old Volkssturm men, just take the weapons off them and send them home, um, obviously posing no danger. Very different in the East. Even if you're captured by the Soviets rather than just shot out of hand, it is likely you are going to end up in a gulag for five or ten years, and not many of them survived it. So just to conclude, so on my left here, very good impression, these two gentlemen of what we'd call early October, November 1944 type Volkssturm men haven't yet and received much more than their weapons, their armband, and a few items of equipment. However, by about April, uh, March, April, they probably mostly more resembled my colleague here, um, a more military uh, impression. However, being killed is being killed, I guess. Um, what's their final stand? That's the battle for Berlin. Um, about half of all of German combat forces in Berlin were Volkssturm men. And so in a sense, the battle of Berlin is very much the Volkssturm battle. Um, as a last stand. So there we go. Well, if you're interested in more information on the Volkssturm, we've got a display in there. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully in about an hour and 15 minutes, you can hopefully enjoy us fighting out there and um, doing our best to combat the Allies. Thank you very much.